The next tiny talk will be presented by Samir Vadva from Qualcomm. The floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Samir. I work in the Mixed Signal Design Group at Qualcomm. And um, today I'll talk about an ultra low power compute in memory chip for always on process ML processing at the edge. Uh, so the way I want to structure this is maybe I spend uh, a little bit of time giving a little bit of background on uh, you know why compute in memory and why we want to look look at this direction for tiny ml um, and then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the chip overview um, the main features and um, the capabilities then we can talk a little bit about uh, the the model mapping flow on this chip and how do we do um, error aware uh, model retraining to account for some of the hardware non-idealities that you expect in a CIM design. And then uh, I'm going to show um, some of the tools that come with this chip, which basically include uh, a compiler and a power profiler that help you essentially get an early estimate for the power numbers, execution times, and so on and so forth. And then I'll conclude. Um, so I think we've, uh, a lot of other speakers before me have already spent motivating why we need ultra low power on the edge. So maybe not spend too much time here, but essentially, you know, um, we need ultra low power on the edge inferencing for to enable privacy, reliability, some of the low latency and power efficiency that these platforms need. And as we go in that direction, um, uh, it's important to have uh, or it would be very useful to have a hardware engine that is very um, um, uh, power efficient um, at the with um, you know, with certain trade offs uh, that we need to make. Um, so this slide here uh, sort of describes the computing power challenge. Um, so on the right hand side, I'm showing some of the numbers that we expect for the energy consumption for the different operations that we may need in a typical uh, deep neural net. So all of these numbers are taken, it's, it's a little bit dated from 45 nanometer TSMC process. It's taken from this reference, which was published in ISSC, ISSCC 2014. But relatively, these um, numbers still um, hold value. So essentially, as you can see here, uh, note that the x-axis here is in log scale. So essentially, DRAM read is uh, the single biggest contributor. So the first thing that you obviously want to be able to do is to be able to you know, uh, keep the entire model on the chip as much as possible. So you don't have to go on the DRAM, uh, go outside the chip at all for any, uh, any you know, model fetches or uh, memory fetches. And then beyond that, um, SRAM and the computation, uh, their, their, um, their uh, uh, energy cons consumption numbers are fairly comparable. Um, so essentially, uh, if you want to make um, edge inferencing uh, more energy efficient, we need to address essentially both of these issues. And as I'll explain in the following slides, compute in memory essentially is uh, uh, provides us a platform for addressing both of these issues uh, at the same time. Um, here's our, here are two, a couple other interesting plots that compare the energy uh, uh, the energy versus the SNR uh, for a digital computation versus mixed signal computation. These are taken from the two references that are listed at the bottom. Uh, so starting from the left plot here, um, as you can see here, um, this top plot here shows the um, uh, shows the digital uh, energy uh, digital en uh, energy consumption versus an SNR. And for people working on mixed signal design, essentially, you know, you know that uh, SNR, you can essentially uh, treat this as the number of bits of quantization that, you know, you need in a given model. So you can look at the x-axis essentially as number of bits, and then the y-axis as the energy consumption. So you can see there's a trade-off there. Um, and the digital uh, energy consumption, obviously, as you scale down, this plot is always coming down. So essentially, if you want to be power efficient, you want to focus on this left side of the plot, uh, which basically means uh, very low uh, 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 quantization bits. And if you, if you can operate in this region where you can live with fewer number of bits in the model, then I think... Um, um, analog computation uh, techniques like CIM 
have a lot to offer. But if you have models that require uh, essentially more than eight bits, then I think uh, CIM and, uh, and analog approaches are not the right way to go. And then the right-hand side plot here essentially is showing where analog can lead us and where we are today. So today, essentially, as you can see here, we can get roughly of the order of five uh, or so uh, tops per watt, but analog compute, assuming you can operate with a uh, low bit count, uh, has the potential to go you know, in excess of 1,000 tops per watt. Um, here I'm comparing three different uh, compute architectures. On the left-hand side is the von Neumann architecture that you're all familiar with. Essentially, you have a compute unit, control unit, ALU, and a memory unit. And as, as you know, I mean, this is very flexible. This is what we've been using for traditionally, uh, but there's uh, significant memory bandwidth issues with this architecture. And, you know, the limitations really show up when you're trying to process workloads like a DNN. And as you go to the right, the middle architecture here is showing a near memory compute um, topology where you have a Mac array, which is sort of, uh, you know, very tightly coupled to, uh, to, to the TCMs, which you can use to provide the input activation and store the output. Uh, this is nice uh, that in, in the sense that you can achieve a lot of parallelism in this architecture, but uh, you still access the memory one sort of row at a time. So essentially you're not really doing anything to amortize the cost that is uh, there with, you know, charging and discharging each and every column on every memory access. So it gets you some improvements, but um, not quite all the way. And in terms of flexibility, it's a little bit less, less flexible than the one Newman approach because, you know, in order to achieve, uh, amortize everything fully, you want the Mac array to be as, you know, well utilized as possible. And on the right-hand side is the topology that we focus in for this talk. This is a, a CIM accelerator topology where essentially the uh, computation or the multiplication and addition is embedded um, in the memory array. And um, here you can access the memory in, in parallel, which means you excite several rows together or all of the rows together. And that way, uh, you essentially, for accessing all of the rows together, uh, you amortize the cost of charging and discharging each of the column lines over you know, the total number of rows that exist uh, in this array. So this tends to be, this can make the, um, uh, the, accum the especially the accumulate operation very uh, power efficient. Also the memory access cost is amortized. So it's uh, very good for power efficiency, uh, but as we'll sh see later, or as I also mentioned previously, the main limitations here would be that it's the least flexible among these three approaches because you want this memory array to be as full as possible to be able to amortize things fully, and um, and and uh, you want to be uh, you want to be able to live with uh, quantization bits which are fewer than eight um, uh, because of the limit limited accuracy in these are in this in this particular architecture. Let's spend a few minutes to talk about the chip overview. Um, so I'm showing a chip micrograph on the right-hand side. So this particular design essentially has three CIM arrays. Um, I'm showing each of them as identical. Uh, in reality, uh, one of them is slightly different than the other. I'll summarize the difference a little bit later. Uh, so essentially each of these uh, CIM arrays sort of forms, uh, or each of uh, these computation blocks forms what you can call as a mixed signal compute unit. And this comprises a CIM array, uh, a very tightly coupled buffer for the activation memory, and then uh, some control uh, and a DMA, which is not quite shown in this uh, block diagram. And then also uh, some digital blocks to be able to do the nonlinear functions and some scaling as you get uh, out from the CIM array. So this, this essentially forms um, uh, one mixed signal compute unit. And, and we have three of these. Um, um, and uh, these three units uh, 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 do have some capability to pass messages to each other. So essentially what you can, the reason why we have three here is that you can map essentially three layers at the same time and pipeline the operation. Um, uh, this can be very useful in certain cases, for instance, you know, where you have resonant layers or a bottleneck layer uh, where you have uh, three layers that you sort of want to run together and the layer sizes in the middle grows a lot. Uh, by mapping all three together, you can actually minimize the memory requirements that will occur because you don't need to save the intermediate results. Uh, you don't quite need to save the uh, intermediate frame sizes, which can be very large for some of these architectures. So there are some advantages to having a multi-core array like this. And the way this array is designed, 
um, essentially um, it's very scalable in the sense that you can add more um, uh, cores and um, the synchronization overhead between these cores is fairly minimal and um, and uh, the cores provide certain uh, hooks to the compiler where um, uh, the compiler can schedule and uh, map operations in a pipeline manner such that the cores you know when they run on the hardware um, they can pass messages to each other and sort of self self synchronize uh, in terms of you know how the outputs are generated and how the how the uh, cores are running so essentially they stall when uh, when the previous data is not quite ready and then and then they kick off and the data is ready on their own so yeah, so fairly flexible design and then uh, outside of these uh, three MSPUs is the rest of the infrastructure, which basically just contains SRAM, microcontroller, some miscellaneous stuff, and, and an L2 memory. Um, here I summarize uh, some of the features that I just mentioned. So essentially we have a multi-core array with three arrays, size 1024 by 256. This is in 22 nanometer. This is also fully compatible with uh, the standard foundry process. Um, and um, other things I think uh, I already mentioned. This is uh, targeted for always on computer vision, voice activation and sensor fusion applications. We do support both binary and ternary modes. Uh, this ternary mode is particularly interesting because it essentially makes um, the core be able to take natively take advantage of sparsity. Uh, so essentially you don't have to um, encode anything or you don't have to do anything special to take advantage of sparsity in this architecture. Just the fact that the um, ter ternary encoding on the input side sort of naturally lends, uh, lends it uh, very suitable to take advantage of sparsity. Um, uh, here I list some of the uh, metrics that we've been able to achieve with this architecture. So um, I'll show some of the profiling results a little bit later, but essentially with a one bit, we can hit about uh, 3000 GOPs. Um, and for an eight bit design, we can hit about 146 GOPs. In terms of tops per rot for a one bit, uh, 789 and then 48 tops per watt for an 8-bit design. Um, uh, this slide here just summarizes some of the performance results that we've been able to achieve. The left-hand side for a binary neural net model and the right-hand side here for an 8-bit uh, model. So as you can see here for an 8-bit model at 1.1% FAR, this is running a TC ResNet 8 model for uh, over, on Alexa dataset for, voice, for keyword detection. You're able to do uh, 7.6 percent um, FRR, um, and then here in the uh, binary neural net model, we're able to hit 1.47 percent. Note that these are at different FAR, so that you can't quite directly compare with each other. Um, I do want to mention that um, uh, during training, uh, the way the mapping flow works is that once you quantize the model and once you train the model, uh, we have a, a noise-aware training flow where we can take the model which is uh, you know quantized and trained using the traditional flows and we run a noise aware training on it which basically um, sort of exposes it to some of the non idealities that you will experience on a cim design design like this and this helps us basically get to all of these numbers that i quoted above um, this slide here just shows uh, the model mapping flow in a little bit more detail uh, just summarizing here essentially you know uh, once you have the model mapped you go through the compiler and you generate the compiled microcode that runs on this accelerator. And we do have, um, it comes with the power profiler, functional model, and also execution time profiler to be able to look at all the detailed results uh, uh, for the models. Um, this slide here is showing the example profile results for a TC ResNet 8 model. Maybe just focus on the right top plot here, which basically shows you the power consumption across you know, different layers. Different The layers are on the x-axis and the computation power is on the y-axis. And these different bars here show, shows you the breakup of the power across different layers. So you can look at this and really say that you know, the green section here, for instance, is the MAC power. So the MAC power uh, is the number one contributor. And then falling closely behind are some of the memory access and uh, some of the other contributors. So looking at this, essentially, this helps us, you know, visualize where the power is going, where the execution time is. The execution time is on the left bottom plot here, and um, helps us essentially uh, helps the user user optimize the models for um, for this particular chip. So essentially, here you can see we're able to achieve about 60 microwatts um, of power consumption run, uh, while running at 10 hertz with this TC ResNet 8 model, which is uh, pretty low. Um, in conclusion, essentially I've demonstrated a silicon proven CIM based accelerator. Uh, this, uh, this accelerator can essentially run, you know, uh, models with a configurable one, two, four, eight bits set, um, 
quantization levels. Um, that it achieves very good energy efficiency at less than eight bit quantized models. Uh, we also have a retraining flow to account for some of the non-idealities, non as I mentioned, and it comes with a hardware compiler and a profiler for fast adoption. Um, and last slide, um, as I stand here, I think I stand on the shoulders of several people who have done a lot of work at Qualcomm. So I do want to acknowledge all the team members who contributed to this in the mixed signal design team, digital design, audio systems, process tech, and corporate R&D, um, system engineering for this project. Um, that's all I have, I'm ready for questions. And also if you would like to uh, reach out to me if you want to try out your models or if you have interest in, if you're a system developer or a uh, model developer who uh, wants to see how their models can run on a CIM based platform, please feel free to reach out to me. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, for audience, you can ask questions in the Avanti uh, website. I have a, a question for you like, uh, in terms of like measuring the energy consumption for this um, like chips and networks, like what is the best way for um, for other people who want to optimize actually the model um, for these specific chips? And is there any provided um, maybe layer wise energy consumption um, uh, from Qualcomm, uh, or yeah, what is so the best practice? Yeah, so I think for this particular chip, it does come with a compiler and a profiler. So if somebody, if somebody is interested, then I think we can provide those tools. It's basically a fairly straightforward, uh, almost a single button click flow where you provide your trained and quantized models, and then the tools retrain it for the hardware non-idealities. And then uh, when we go through the compiler, generate the microcode, and then uh, the profiler profiles the code and essentially spits out the breakup for the execution time and the power consumption. So those tools are available. If anybody is interested, yeah, feel free, please feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. First, it's ARM uh, that develops software and hardware for TinyML. Qualcomm. Samsung. These three are the executive, executive sponsors. And, and then followed by platinum sponsors. PTA Compute. Lattice Semiconductors. And the gold sponsors are Brain Chip Corporation. Cisco, DSP Group, H Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, Gerald Matter Labs, uh, Green Waves Technologies. Hymex, Imagine Mob, Legend AI, Maxim Integrated, Pixel. Reality AI, SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sintiant, and Google TensorFlow. Exmos and the silver sponsors are H Cortex, Hoots, and uh, Sinsense. Again, we are very grateful for their continued support, and this is a great testimony that uh, the foundation and this community is, re is really of, of huge interest for for the companies and 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 for the whole uh, for the whole world.